who were born into prison as children of prisoners. At first, we were not even aware of our status and horrible condition. We were ignorant of our chains, blind to the bars that surrounded and confined us. Unaware of any other existence, we lived in a dark, ugly, putrid dungeon of death. Then one day, a visitor came. His name was Law, and he rattled on the bars and shone light into our darkness, disrupting our world of peaceful imprisonment. Law came to tell us about God. He told us of love and righteousness, of goodness and blessings, and of the joys of freedom. He pointed out our squalid, impoverished imprisonment and lamented the filth and hunger and disease of our existence. He even promised that one day we could be free. But not today. Not now. We begged and pleaded, open the doors, release our chains, let us go free. Sadly, he turned to go and simply said, I cannot. I cannot. And as he trudged slowly away, we returned to our prison, now aware, now angry at our condition. Unable to escape, we continued the vigil of misery, brokenness, and death with only the faintest of hope for freedom. Time passed. Conditions worsened. The darkness deepened. Evil grew and wickedness birthed wickedness. Deceit and lies became leaders among us, convincing many that they were already free, teaching that if you were better than your cellmates, then that constituted goodness and righteousness, and you were free and they were not. Many listened, but most saw through the emptiness of their words. We were at the point of total despair, resigned to eternal imprisonment when another visitor arrived. Unlike law, he didn't stand outside and call attention to our problems. He came inside. He moved into our prison. His name was Grace. And he moved with such dignity, compassion, and freedom that we couldn't help but follow. From cell to cell he walked, casting words of hope, healing wounds of despair, letting the light of his love chase the darkness away. We begged Grace to stay with us. Oh, please, please stay, we cried. You brighten up our prison and free our spirits. But Grace shook his head and smiled. I didn't come here, he said, to live with you. I came so that you could live with me. And with that statement, he turned and walked toward the door. And the most amazing thing happened. As Grace touched the outer door, All the doors opened, and all the chains fell off. And he invited us to go with him, to live free forever. For a moment, we hesitated as all those denied dreams of those darkest hours shattered the only reality we had ever known. Freedom, that which had just been a word, a concept beyond hope, was now actually offered to us, to all of us. And then we responded. Some burst for the open door, shouting and singing. Some walked with confidence to the broken bars, smiles on their faces and tears in their eyes. Others stepped cautiously to the entrance, nervous and unsure until they felt the cool breeze and the warmth of the sunshine. And they too entered into the freedom of grace. But not all walked out. In the most unbelievable and incredible twist of events, many chose to stay in the darkness, in the filth, in the prison. They even tried to rechain themselves and close the doors. Why? Were they afraid of the light? Were they more comfortable with the pain and despair they knew than the discomfort of change that freedom demanded? Were they so deceived and blinded by a lifetime of lies that now they were immune to the truth? At times, they even laughed at us, mocked and ridiculed those who were unchained, free in Christ. They tried to keep people in prison who wanted freedom, telling them lies of danger, pain, and sacrifice that awaited them outside the safe confines of their prison cells. And many remain to this day, living in darkness, bound by despair, afraid of the light. And yet some still find their way to freedom 
discovering the fullness of grace and the wonders of life. But being set free doesn't always mean that we live free. For we are people of routine, repeating the habits of captivity even while we walk in freedom. Some who are free even try to impose imaginary bars and spiritual chains to comfort themselves. Their minds are still more at ease with the pain of law than the freedom of grace. And all of us who are free struggle with the memories of prison and the voices that bid us to return to captivity. It is only when we remember the words of truth and follow the steps of the one who freed us that we truly become free. Today, we challenge you to live in grace and be set free. I invite you to take a seat and to grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7 is our text today. We're continuing our study of Romans, uh, just walking through this chapter by chapter. Uh, and uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1,121 and you will find our text today, Romans chapter 7. And as always, if you're here and you need a Bible, you don't have one, you want one, you're committed to reading the Word of God, then please take one of these with you. It's our gift to you. You're not stealing it. We want you to have it. Uh, as I told someone earlier, one condition, just read it. Because we know if you read the Word of God, then God will change your life. Hey, Romans 7 is uh, an explanation by the Apostle Paul as to why we struggle as Christians to live the life that God intended. And I shared a parable uh, a little bit ago with you based on Romans uh, chapter 7. Uh, and it's a chapter where the Apostle Paul gets brutally honest about the battle that we face as followers of Jesus. And first of all, we see the purpose of the law is to reveal sin. The purpose of the law is to reveal sin. Romans chapter 7, I'm going to pick up in verse 7. And the Apostle Paul writes, What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. So the law, the purpose of the law, is to reveal sin in us. See, when we don't know God's law, we still live in captivity. We're just unaware of that captivity. We're, we're, you know, we're not really sure that what it looks like and, and that we're captives. But Romans chapter 1, where the Apostle Paul started, describes the, the reality that everyone knows God's law on their heart. They don't know the details, but they know the, the truth about God because he's revealed his, himself in, and his attributes in nature, in creation, all around us, and he's written them in our hearts. So everybody is without excuse. But then God gave his law, his understanding of how we are to live our lives, his wisdom to us, you know, kind of summarized in the Ten Commandments. And he said, this is how I want my people to live. And he, and he gave that to the Israelites as his chosen people in the Old Testament and said, here's the law. And they took the law and they couldn't live it. They, they couldn't live up to it. It revealed their sin. It told them what God expected, and they failed over and over and over again. The Jews had the law, and they couldn't keep it. By the way, this is why legalistic religion, whether it's the Old Testament variety or whether it's what's practiced in a lot of churches now, is so unfulfilling because we can't keep the rules. I mean, I'm a lawbreaker. Anybody else with me here? You know, I just can't keep the rules. There's like eight of you raised your hands. I'm like, really? Seriously? Man, you guys really need this sermon then. Okay, so we can't keep the rules. So we got two options when it comes to legalistic religion, this law-based religion. Either we just give up. We just quit and go, I can't do it, so forget it. And we walk away from it. Or we take our eyes off of God and we put them on other people and we start comparing our lives to other people's lives and we try to feel better because we're better than them. And, and so we go, okay, well, I'm, I'm more holy than you. I'm more righteous than you. I'm better than you, so I'm good. And 
and here's the thing, neither option of legalistic religion leads to any kind of contentment, satisfaction, or joy. It's joyless to walk away from God's law, and it's joyless to uh, try to compare yourself to other people. Uh, the law reveals our sin. It reveals our condition. It shows us who we are. Uh, it doesn't do any, really anything else. Uh, and that stands in contrast to the purpose of grace, which is to forgive our sin. Grace forgives our sin. Now, I want to point to bookends of this chapter. Hey, let me give you a little bit of history lesson. When Paul wrote this letter to Romans, it did not have chapters and verses. How many of you have ever written a letter? I know that's not all of you because some of you have never written, any, you know, other than your signature. But uh, that's okay. You've typed a letter. You've, when, you, when you send an email, when you write a letter, uh, when you correspond in any way, do you put down chapters and verses in your letters? No, neither did Paul. Okay, he just wrote a letter. And, and hundreds of years later, there was a guy who said, you know, it's so hard to study the Bible. I, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to put chapters and verses. So he did that, which makes it a whole lot easier for us to say, turn to Romans 7, and we're looking at verse 7, doesn't it? It makes it easy for us, but it's not necessarily what Paul was thinking, because a lot of times we think where the chapter starts and ends, a thought starts and ends, but it's not the case. So Romans 6, 23, the last verse of chapter 6 is about grace. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And then if you turn a page and look at Romans 8, 1, it says, For there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This, this Romans chapter 7 is not real encouraging, uh, but uh, it's bookended by grace. By reminding us of Jesus and pointing us to Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross for us and our hope of salvation through him. So law reveals sin, grace forgives it. Law points out our prison, but grace opens the doors and breaks our chains. See, this is the good news of Jesus Christ. This is the gospel, that we were lost and Jesus found us. That we were in prison and Jesus set us free. We were dead and Jesus raised us. You see, that's why our mission at Calvary is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Yeah, our, our mission, lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. It's all about introducing people to Jesus because we know when they meet Jesus, Jesus will change their lives. See, again, this is why, you know, legalistic churches struggle so much because they're trying to make bad people good. They want bad people to become good. So your life is messed up, and you've got to turn your life around, you've got to do this. And by the way, here's all the rules you've got to follow, and here's all the expectations we have of you. And there's no joy because we can't follow the rules, and we can't meet other people's expectations. And if you live for that, you'll be crushed by that. Absolutely no joy in legalism whatsoever. So let me just be honest. At Calvary, and this can make some of you uncomfortable, but we don't really care whether you're good or bad. Okay? We're not concerned about how good you are or how bad you are. And the reason is, is because we know that you're all bad. Okay? I mean, if you read the Bible, it kind of makes that point. If you read Romans, you know, all the way up to this point, it's been pretty much, hey, guys, guess what? You're bad. Yeah, none of you are righteous, not even one. All of you have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, and, and Paul is, you know, describing his own struggle with badness. He's like, hey, I can't do it. So you know, let's just be honest. We're all bad. There's not, you know, it's not about good and bad. It's just about degrees of badness. So you know, we're all in the same boat. Yeah, that boat is we need Jesus. And so here at Calvary, we want to introduce you to Jesus because we know if you experience a life-changing relationship with Jesus, guess what? Jesus Christ will change your life. When you confess Jesus as Lord, God the Holy Spirit inhabits your life. He writes his name on your life. He guarantees your salvation. And he starts convicting you of sin. He starts teaching you the truth and applying it to your life and, and growing you in the character of Jesus. And so we know that you can't follow Jesus and stay the same. We know your life is going to change. We know if you have that life-changing experience with Jesus Christ, everything's going to be different eventually. And love is patient, so we'll wait for it. And we'll celebrate life change as it happens. We'll celebrate it when it happens, like baptisms. We celebrate the you know, young man this morning. We celebrate the 17 kids the last two weeks. We celebrate 160 baptisms this past 12 months. Uh, by the way, that's more than we've ever baptized before in a church here. Isn't that cool? I mean, see, that's just evidence that God's at work, because I don't even know all 160 of them. 
See, it's not about a person. It's about Jesus and what he does in our lives. And so, you know, we don't care if you're good or bad. We just care that you know Jesus. So, have you experienced a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ? Have you come to that place in your life where you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world? You believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins. It's personal. And that he was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus Christ with your life? Because there's no more important decision you can make than that one. And if you're sitting here and you're not sure or you know you haven't made it, then you can stop listening to me and you can start talking to God and, and you can simply say, Jesus, I surrender to you. I want you to change my life. And he will do that. He will do that. You want to talk to somebody? Prayer team's going to be here after the service. They would love to talk to you. Pastors are going to be at Connection Centers. They would love to talk to you. We want to talk to you because we want to celebrate with you that God is changing your life. Now, if you are a follower of Jesus and you know that, then let's discuss the conflict within us. The conflict within us. Uh, let's pick up verse 14, because, again, Paul gets brutally honest here, and we need to hear it. By the way, you're going to find yourself in this text. You may want to go home and read this text again. Uh, uh, but he's not really talking about you. I mean, he is. He's talking about me, but he's talking about himself. He says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do not do what I want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's a conflict within us. And realize that the man who's writing this is Paul the Apostle, who God used to write half the New Testament, who impacted the Roman Empire with the gospel, who started churches all over the known world at the time. And he's saying the same things that you and I are feeling and struggling with and fighting. And that's because if you're a follower of Jesus, you, you're like Paul, you want to follow Jesus, but you choose to rebel. Because that's my story. I want to follow Jesus, and I choose to rebel. Any other rebels in here with me? Yeah, see, that, that's who we are. And that's because two natures are battling for your life. Two natures are battling for your life. Paul's talking about that battle in Romans 7. He summarizes it in Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, when he says, For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Okay, so here's the reality. We're sinners. Okay, we live in this thing called the flesh that is tainted by sin, that is addicted to sin, that craves sin. And so therefore, we're drawn to selfishness. We're drawn to self-destructive activities. That's our sin nature. That's part of who we are. At the same time, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit in you. The Holy Spirit is righteous and pure and holy. And he's calling us to follow Jesus into a life uh, of discipleship, a life of, of learning, a life of growth, to a life that, that looks like Jesus. And those two natures are in conflict with one another. And that conflict is one that is not going to take a break. There's not going to be any truce talks. There's not going to be any peace talks. There's, you know, there's not a halt in the action. It is going on every day of your life until the day you die or Jesus comes back. Because when you die or when Jesus comes back, you're going to get a new body. <laughs> I always expect people to cheer at that point. Just like stand up and go, you know, especially the older ones. I mean, I get the younger ones who are like, I like my body. 
Anybody over 50 is like, my body sucks. <laughs> when can I trade it in? Yeah, when God decides, not you, okay? So uh, until then, you endure with joy. But see, here's the thing. We get new bodies, which are not going to be tainted by sin, so you're not going to want to do the evil. They're not going to be craving the evil anymore, and you're going to do what God wants you to do then. See, that, that's the conflict that's going on inside of you. That's our reality. There's two natures who are battling for your life. And, and uh, by the way, did you catch Paul's you know, words about this? For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am. Who's going to deliver me from this body of death? It's going on inside of us. And, and, and we want to do better. So we're facing a choice. Captivity or freedom? Captivity or freedom. It's, it's our choice. Because we've been set free by Jesus... He's opened the doors. He's released the chains. He, he, you know, he, if the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. And, and so Jesus came to set us free, rescue us from hell, give us life. He does all of that. But now that you're free, you can choose to live in freedom or captivity. See, captivity is surrendering to the flesh. It's surrendering to that sin nature. It's giving in to your evil desires, uh, your selfishness. It's buying what the world is selling, you know, because the world sells pleasure and fun and enjoyment and success, and all of it only leads to misery and sorrow and pain. So you can give in to captivity. You can choose captivity, or you can choose freedom. Uh, you can fight for freedom. You can be the person that God redeemed you to be. You can, you know, experience victory and purpose and satisfaction and joy, but it's a battle and if you choose to fight, you've got to know the deciding factors. You've got to know the deciding factors. Are we going to fight the battle or not? You know, because I know what happens in all of us. We, we leave here on Sunday morning and we're like, God, I want to follow you. I want to serve you. I want to do better. I'm going to repent of this. My words are going to be better this week. I'm going to treat my wife better and my husband better. I'm not going to yell at my kids as much. And, and you get out and you get in the car and you're leaving the parking lot and somebody cuts you off and you lose it right there. Right? You just lose it right there. And you're like, you know, you're, you're yelling at them and you're saying things you shouldn't say and you're making, doing sign language that isn't honoring to God. And, and you didn't even get to sweet water and you've like blown it for the week. We want to do better. We really do. We want to win more than we lose. We want to live in freedom more than we live in captivity. And captivity is calling our name to come home, to come back. So we, we just got to be honest about what are, the, what are the things that we need to do or lean into that are going to tip the scales for freedom. They're going to help us to win more than we lose. Because God doesn't expect perfection. He expects improvement. Uh, so here's, some, here's four influences in your life that uh, I'm going to encourage you to lean into if you want to grow in freedom. First one is truth. Truth. Uh, that's the Bible. That's, you know, knowing God's word, knowing God's wisdom in your life. There's a reason we give these away. Because we want you to understand what God says about life. Uh, you may or may not know this, but uh, Jesus said, if you remain in my word, then you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will do what? Truth will set you free. See, we love to say, the truth will set you free. It will, if you know it. If you don't know the truth, then that's just a like, pithy saying that has no power in your life. You actually have to know the truth for it to set you free. Because our enemy, Satan, is the father of lies. Satan only has two powers against you. Fear and lies. The only way you can counter the lies is to know the truth. If you don't know the truth, you're going to believe his lies and you're going to go down that path of destruction. It's kind of like deciding, I'm going to drink the poison and hopefully I'll feel better. That's what Satan's selling, and that's what we do. And the only way that you know what the poison is, is if you know what the truth is, so you can choose to drink the water of life. But you got to know the truth. 
Are you putting the truth in your life? Are you reading God's word? Are you learning God's word? Are you, are you studying God's word? Are you doing anything to put this book and its words into your soul so that God can build you up in truth? Because if you want to live free, you got to lean into the truth. And then if you want to live free, if you want to win more than you lose, you got to practice worship. Worship. Worship is just practicing the presence of God. It's living in his awareness. It's what Paul meant by when he said, pray without ceasing. Uh, it, it, and we do it here corporately. We gather together as a group of people to praise God, to celebrate the life that he's given us, the forgiveness that he offers us, to tell him thank you corporately. That's what we're doing when we're singing, by the way. It's not people up here performing. It's inviting you to join in and praising God for what he's done in your life and, and to celebrate that together. Uh, but it doesn't stop when the band stops. It continues in the teaching part where we listen to God and we say, okay, God, what do you want me to learn? How do you want me to change? Uh, and it's not about the person speaking. It's about the truth of God's word penetrating your life through the Holy Spirit, applying it to you, which is why sometimes you feel like I'm just talking to you. I'm not. But that's the Holy Spirit going, hey, 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 I have something for you, something that will change your life. So whenever you tell me that I spoke, was speaking to you, you know what that I hear? You're listening to the Holy Spirit. That's kind of cool. That's kind of cool. So, but, but it's worship, and, and it can't just stop here. When you leave here, you've got to continue in your private life. It's got to continue in your prayer time. It's got to continue in your quiet time or devotion time as you read and as you sing and as you listen to the, the words of Christian songs. Hopefully, it's not just an hour on the weekend. Hopefully it's a part of your life. If you want to experience freedom, then you got to lean into worship. you got to lean into truth. you got to lean into serving. You know, Jesus said if you want to be great, you have to be the servant of everyone. He said the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And then he demonstrated it by at the Last Supper, the night he was going to get you know, brutally attacked and betrayed and tortured. He got down on his hands and knees and he washed his servants' feet, his disciples' feet. Um, serving is exercising your faith. See, it's all important. We've got to have faith. We've got to believe. We've got to believe the right stuff. We've believe. But if you're not doing anything with your faith, then your faith is going to get flabby and weak. It's kind of like with your body, you know? You try to get in shape. You try to stay in shape because if you don't stay in shape, then you just atrophy and, and you'll get weak and flabby. That's why when you're, you know, you have a knee replacement or break a hip or something like that and, and, and they replace it and, they, and then they send you to rehab to torture you, right? The torture of rehab. Oh, you got hurt. We're going to rehab you. Why? Because they got to build up your strength. Guess what? God wants to build up your faith. And the only way it's going to get strong is if you exercise your faith by serving. And I'm not even just talking about in a defined role with a title and a name tag or something like that here at the church building. I'm talking about using your influence to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. In whatever way God opens the doors for you to do that. Exercising your faith, because if you don't exercise your faith, if you don't serve, then you're going to become a weak, flabby Christian. Little girly man Christian that can't do anything. You say all the right things, but you don't have any power, no strength. And then finally, if you want to win more than you lose, you got to lean into friends. Friends. 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul says, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Who are your friends? Who are the people you're hanging out with? Who are the people that are influencing your life that you are traveling with? Sharing life with. Uh, and, and I'm not talking about not having any, you know, uh, unchurched friends because I want you to have unchurched friends that you are try seeking to lead into a life-changing relationship with Jesus. I'm just talking about who, who's the crowd that you hang with? Who are the people that are speaking into your life, encouraging your life, uh, pointing you in the direction of life? Because it makes a difference. By the way, that's why we want everyone plugged into a life group here at Calvary. We want you to surround yourself with people who love Jesus like you love Jesus, who, who want to honor Jesus with their life, who want to serve together and share life together, who, who engage in mutual accountability, who are there to encourage each other when you're down, to teach each other, uh, and honestly, to pick you up when you fall. We all need those people in our lives. And that's where real church happens is in life group. So, truth, worship, serving, friends. Are you choosing captivity or freedom? 
because we're in a battle and you know the deciding factors and you know that Jesus has called you to freedom. The Apostle Paul says it was for freedom that Christ has set you free. Don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. Let's pray.